what are the major lessons to successfully raising capital? I'm sure this is a question that you get yeah. asked all the time. As somebody who has been successful raising capital, mm. I believe there's a unique perspective you've had because you've not just done it once, you've yeah. done it a couple of times. So again, I'll ask, what are the major lessons to successfully raise capital? I think in hindsight, in talking to friends who've done this, I mean, for me, you know, Richard, I'm unapologetically Christian. And so I apply a lot of biblical truths to what I do. So I've just come to realize the Bible says, if you see a diligent man, he will stand before kings. So diligence is one of the things. And, and so as people come to look at a due diligence on the organization, be diligent about how you deliver information to them, data to your investors. Um, believability of the idea is almost at par with believability of the person mm. <laughs> and and so i think people have to either have so if you're doing it for the first time you're going to have a challenge in that you have to have a really compelling concept because what people buy into is your experience i can't i can't sit here and pretend to you that the fact that i've not done it before helps mm -hmm. But if I've never done it before, what happened those days is that I knocked on 200 doors and one opened. Whereas now down the line, I knock on fewer doors and they open because either someone really likes you or they can't stand you. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they love your story or can't stand your story. So you know very quickly, is it going south? Is it going north? Is it happening? Is it not happening? Um, so I'd, I'd say my experience is research data preparedness if possible the secret i've discovered works very well is um a minimum viable pilot mm, product product mm -hmm. something that you can actually demo that i've done this to this point i just need to scale and i need your help to scale that does a lot for people than a concept on paper so to be realistic, uh -huh. the last capital I raised, I first went and made sure I had a contract from a very large company. It wasn't an easy contract to get, but I had a contract. Uh -huh. So because I had a contract, my experience plus believability kind of paired up because how did you get a contract from this large organization? So that's how you start to find people saying, okay, mm, I don't want to miss this bus. <laughs> the fact that the person has this contract, it helps. Mm -hmm. So have something. You have, to have, you have to bring something to the table. If you're raising capital, bring something to the table. You're not going to just convince someone because you have an idea that they should put money behind you. And he, another thing I've seen with a lot of us younger entrepreneurs is getting upset because people say no. <laughs> My God, you will have many knows mm -hmm. you will have many knows i got used to knows and i realized it's not personal don't don't personalize this thing you know it's yes it's your dream it's your vision but i've seen people who refuse to speak to me again because i didn't i didn't back them and not, we're not trying to be best friends <laughs> you know i do wish them well but not everybody will be as passionate first of all nobody's as passionate about your idea as you are mm -hmm. And that thing you have to always realize. Um, I was speaking somewhere and I was telling them when you study the book of Nehemiah, um, Nehemiah went and asked the king in the Bible about um, whether he could have certain resources for um, going to build up the walls yep. of Jerusalem. And But first he had to speak the king's language. You know, when he came to the king, he said, um, the city of my father's, the city of my fathers and ancestors. Now he was talking to a Phoenician king. That means these Phoenicians were so big on ancestral stuff. Mm. So he didn't just come, because remember it's the king who had shut them down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he didn't just come and start saying, Jerusalem is messed up, I'm, I need help. You know, he said, the city of my fathers and my ancestors lies in ruins. Immediately, he tapped into something the king was passionate about there was connection there was connection he made mm. sure there was a connection so you can't just come ask for capital because you're passionate mm. <laughs> make a connection oh, can i just piggyback on this and say yeah. everybody always asks the question about how to raise investment yeah i want to push on to this question and say when is the investment wrong 
because the, the desperation for looking for capital you begin saying yes to everybody mm. so i want to know when should you be like or in your life have you had times when you're like i wish i didn't take this investment because now it's costly mm. yeah <laughs> so w- so the question i think i'm trying to push and ask is what kind of investments would you be like yo i know you want money but keep away from this because of yeah. this and this and this i mean so money is a means to an end you, you've got to have it in your heart mind what's your end game and what kind of capital brings you to your end game because some capital is punitive i'll say that and risk to say this <laughs> sometimes you have to live to fight another day sometimes you have to live to fight another yeah. day so that means that you you could end up taking that capital that's not as ideal but it's the only one available i'm not going to tell someone walk away from it because it's not ideal i don't think you're going to find a 100% ideal capital unless it's yours hmm. <laughs> anybody you bring into your business angel they're called angel investors but there's sometimes nothing angelic <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing angelic about, the- <laughs> about that kind of money um so you know you have to study dilution dilution clauses how to protect yourself right um Mark Zuckerberg doesn't own all of Facebook in fact he's not a majority shareholder mm. in the sense of 50 plus 1%. Yes. Right? The last I checked I think he was at about 11%. I don't know where he is now, but he has protected himself by the kind of um protection rights that he could get for a founder. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you may not necessarily be the majority shareholder, but you could get protections as a founder. You could get sophisticated in how the paperwork is done. The fascination I find with people who want to own 90% of their businesses I found in the area of things like what I do in fintech mm-hmm. <laughs> that world moves so fast that to stay as a 90% owner for 5 years can be complete can cause you to have a slow death. Mm. You could end up becoming 90% of something that never moves. Right? Um Equity Bank is a publicly traded bank. Has anyone ever bothered to look at what the shareholding of Dr. Mwangi is? <laughs> I guarantee it's not much. So you don't have but look what he's built. Mm. <laughs> look what that entire team has built, right? Admired all over the world. I don't know if he gets the right admiration in Kenya, but admired all over the world for what they've achieved, but he's not necessarily a 20% shareholder. Mhm. This fascination with shareholding, I know you need to keep control, but explore ways to be protected. as you look for this capital so so i won't say don't take the capital cuz how will you scale. how will you scale how work. will you have experience how will you grow so case in point a, a gentleman came and told me how he refused certain capital 4 years ago he came to see me just about 3 4 weeks ago nothing has changed in his business hmm. he's now saying maybe i need to shut it down he might have stood a chance because that capital would have changed his business and how he was looking at things and how and sometimes the help that comes is also showing you your blind spots. Let me tell you Richard, one of the things entrepreneurship has taught me, especially as I'm getting older, I'm not getting any younger, is the 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 power of self-awareness. Mm. And some capital brings help for you to know what kind of person you are. Yeah. And maybe a great founder but a horrible CEO. Mm. <laughs> you may be a great innovator, a horrible administrator. Capital will tell you. Capital will tell you. So sometimes you may say the capital was bad, but maybe you're just not self-aware that you're not a very good leader. Mm. <laughs> and you need to know what are my blind spots? Am I a self-righteous annoying I don't know you some individual <laughs> individual <laughs> Are you with me? Yep. Um so capital is capital is tricky but capital capital can be revealing. Mm. And and the more you mature the more capital likes people who have matured because they understand that you're not going to get all things ticked in the boxes you want ticked but you can live with this and not live with that 
you make mm. the choices again i'll stick to this conversation about raising capital mm. when and i'm just uh, some of these questions are coming as you speak please so i find that some people want capital immediately they're starting the business mm. and i feel like sometimes you need to not have the capital to not grow and m- sort of when is when should you get capital is it okay to sometimes start without capital and i know that sounds weird saying that um, but what are your thoughts on when should you ask for capital i i think that's a tough one to answer because end game is always you have to someone has to know their end game so yes it's okay not to start with capital but how long will you take to scale mm. Having been exposed to different markets, different countries, um, there's different flavors to how capital works in certain places, right? Um, Square just made an acquisition of a buy now, pay later sister business out of Australia and paid billions and billions of dollars for it. That company has never made a profit, mm. right? Um, and Afterpay is the is the company, and then. You've got valuations of other types of businesses that have scaled to 15 countries in the Western world. People don't buy the bottom line, really, in the sense they buy something else in those businesses, which is growth. Yep. So sometimes you have to figure out what your end game is. Do you want to get purchased, acquired for growth? Do you want to build a family enterprise? <laughs> You want to build a family enterprise what you're saying works mm. if this is more of a cash cow for you and your wife for you guys to have a particular way of life every week knowing that we sold um one million uh, avocados it's just you and i nobody else so be it mm. you make a call based on what you want to build if you have ambitions to say i would like my business to be valued at 400 million dollars in the next five years if i achieve one two three then you decide how you want to grow you can't get there without capital i get that um and so this capital opens doors for you scales for you helps you grow helps you understand different things and capital is different there's african capital there's western capital there's there's money that cannot come to Africa. There's money that cannot go out of Africa. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to really do your homework to know where do I want to sit. So, case in point, in one of my businesses, I did what you call a pre-seed. Mm-hmm. And then from a pre-seed series, then I move into a series A. a yeah. My pre-seed valuations determine how I will... My last pre-seed valuation may determine how I want my series A to be valued. Yeah. Pre-seed is a place you can get money before the business has really kicked off, but certain things have to be there. Yep. Then I go through this process of proving concept. The moment I can prove pilot and that now all I need to do is scale and I can show certain transactions and certain volumes, I get the right people to buy into it. Mm-hmm. In between that journey, if you consider that a pre-series and then this journey yep. here, there are some advisors you need to get. Mm. Some amazing people who can get you to scale the right way. And these guys are found in different parts of the world. You'll find some in London, in New York. They have connections to a lot of funds. Mm. So don't necessarily go out on what you call a roadshow without these guys. So they become very good tellers of your story. Mm. They get to understand your business and there's nothing you're doing. They will ask you very hard questions. They will tell you you're not ready. They will tell you stuff you don't want to hear. I'm now talking to people who want to go this direction. Mm. So for you to say, I raised 10 million in Series A Kenya shillings. I want to raise... 500 million the pre-series out raise 500 million you have to have this say, and let me ask actually i love in fact i think to better articulate my question mm. was definitely you need capital but i feel like is there a perspective of in in pre-seed mm. where you may at a, such a low valuation probably the lowest valuation that the company should be at is at pre-seed now you're selling off 80 percent of the company is it is so from uh from a from a raising investors perspective should you have a limitation on the equity that you give out of your mm. business at this precede yeah so i i look at it in a few ways that's that's a very good question so at precede you have to ask yourself at, 
So you can leave from Nairobi to Mombasa and decide you want to be on the road for 12 hours. You just go stopping, doing whatever. Or you can say I need to be in Mombasa in four hours. Mm. Your speed will be determined by what time you need to arrive there. Yep. Is that fair? Mm. So it's the same with a business. The speed at which I need to arrive at my end game mm-hmm. should determine what kind of pre-series conversations I'm going to have. I have no problem being a 20% shareholder, just to give you an idea, of a pre-series game, or a pre-series race, sorry, where the intention is for me to scale to become a unicorn in five years. Aha. Uh-huh. Because you'll be uh, 20% of a billion dollar company. 10% maybe, because okay. I'll still yeah, yeah, you'll still yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, in yeah. between. Even if it's 5%. Over a $1 billion dollar <laughs> game. So the important thing is, is in my pre-series mm. Mm. who did i bring in so i selectively picked a particular type of people at pre-series that bring so much value to my end game thinking it wasn't by chance and i have no problem with us having smaller shares because the end game is clear mm. and it's worth the risk it may never happen but i'm aware by being a 90% shareholder, that's a hard thing to achieve. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get serious people coming and saying, I'll take 1%. Yep. You're not. If you find them, not for the unicorn valuation, not something you haven't built yet. Uh-huh. Right? People can take 1% of a very serious organization, but you haven't built it. So, so, so sometimes who you may need to have besides money is value. Mm. What value do they bring? to their table. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? 100%. And so you have to understand your end game. Now, if I want to be a farmer and I'm willing to take 25 years to build my farm, then I don't need to give away too much shareholding at the beginning. Mm. I want to build a generational company. I'm starting um, starting a um, a, um, auto repair shop that I want to build for my children to also take over. I don't need to over-engineer my pre-series. I want to stay in control. Mm. Even at 20%, you can have a lot of control. (laughs) It just depends on who are your lawyers and how is that work being done. So, you want to reach Unicorn as your end end game? And Unicorn here meaning a business valued at over a billion dollars? Then you have to play your cards right from who's here in the beginning to who will be at the end. Mm. That value chain is extremely important. You want to be a mom and pop shop? <laughs> Own 98% of your business. Don't be in a rush. Take 12 hours to reach Mombasa. Mm. Take your time. But know what you're building and know that it'll give you a milli here, two million there, you know, and sort out your <laughs> uh, few things here, pay school fees there, but, but you're not going to go. Let me say this about unicorns. Sometimes in these fast-paced companies, the people who look down upon them, they don't like them because they feel the fundamentals don't make sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Fundamentals meaning unit economics, what is the um, bottom line looking like, what's your EBIT. I've seen companies valued at uh, $4 billion that have no EBIT. Mm. Zero. Mm. For those who may not understand EBIT explanation. Earnings before income tax. Uh Because that just basically shows your bottom line. So sometimes some of these companies are valued on EBIT. They say that um, sometimes in fintechs you can get 10 to even 25x EBIT. So if your EBIT is a million dollars, you can be valued at 25 million dollars, 10 million Mm dollars. Because they can see you have unit economics makes sense. I found that what you'd call European money, London money, loves that brick and mortar type of thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, American money is very driven towards this growth story. That's why you can find a pre-series in America for $20 million Mm. and not find a pre-series in Africa for more than $5 million. Why? Because those guys sometimes are driving a growth conversation. Mm -hmm. Grow this thing, Uber may never have an EBIT. Yep. But the... I don't want to sound too sophisticated. Sometimes the sacrifice is for an entrepreneur to have EBIT 
they decide I won't open in Uganda and Tanzania and Nigeria because if I do, I have to spend money that I'm making. Mm -hmm. Because of that, I won't have a bottom line. Yep. So sometimes to have EBIT, you have to sacrifice growth. <laughs> so the argument is always, what do you want? Do you want growth or do you want EBIT? And very, sometimes what I'd call not very ambitious investors, if I can use a kind word, want both. <laughs> they want. <laughs> That's rough. <laughs> you know, it's very tough for some entrepreneurs to achieve two of those lines that mm. give me growth and give me EBIT. At an early stage of a business, you're not going to achieve those things. So sometimes money you get can be very crude in what it wants you to achieve. And you have to drive and be smart to say, no, I'm going to give you growth. I'm not going to give you EBIT. Mm. Because my ambitions, <clears throat> the ambitions of what I've put out in my business plan is to be in 20 markets or to have a diversity of products mm. to bring us to that level. So that's how you look at capital. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Okay, let me try and switch up the conversations. Okay. Oh, about over here a bit. Okay. How do you plan and build cash reserves? Hmm. Cash reserves are a very interesting conversation. So, so cash reserves come back to what we've just talked about. That whole EBIT versus growth. Uh, I'm I'm scared of a business that has to grow that has to have cash reserves. Because mm. <laughs> mm. are you then growing at the right pace? Are you... So, and, and that's why I'll tell you, Richard, I've seen a very fundamental difference in American money versus European money mm. in terms of investment versus African money. Yep. Yeah. And then what African type of, de demand cash reserves. Yes. <laughs> yes. Africans demand cash reserves. How much money do you have in the bank? Which is good. You need to know that because there are things you have to calculate when you're looking at your business. You have to understand what your cash burn ratio is, right? How much cash am I burning? Mm. When am I going to run out of money? Mm. So if I'm going to have a series A by uh, December 2022, do I have enough cash that the business is generating to keep the lights on until that time? Secondly, also when when um, when you have cash ban and an investor smells desperation, mm. it's also not a good thing. So sometimes you need to approach an investor not when money is finished, yep. when you still have some surplus. Mm. And the conversations are very different. So I love I love what you're saying there, and, and I think that's worth repeating. Mm. The desperation from an entrepreneur when there's cash ban and lack of reserves, how you approach the investor is very different from when you've got when when, when you're not in a desperate stage. Yeah, uh -huh. your, your disposition when you're desperate is different from your disposition when you when you can hold on for a year. Mm. And most of these guys can smell it. <laughs> put all the smiles you want, put all the, they can smell it, they can sniff it. In fact, some of them are called sniffers. <laughs> <laughs> they can sniff that desperation. And that means they can get you to dilute a lot more than you need. Mm. So, um, and, and to preserve cash burn, you may have to make tough decisions. You may have to make decisions about layoffs. You may have to make decisions about, you know, so what's your team structure like? I'll tell you a mistake a lot of people make when they raise money. They employ a lot of people. Mm. I'm, I've become very slow at employment. Very slow. I mean, I'm not, I, I've refused anymore to have this. Um, I'm not the savior of the world. And, and I, I just wanted to say that in the most polite <laughs> way I can. I'm not I, I don't I'm not looking for any award of the largest employer of the global mm. <laughs> you know award because sometimes entrepreneurs have to differentiate between their uh, charity preferences and running a business mm. and you can't employ everybody you just can't 
and so are these lessons that you i mean you are yeah, yeah, currently yeah. building a different business right now yeah is is this lessons that your previous business taught you did you yes. take that approach yes with I, your previous I mean, business i appreciate everybody that i've been able to help and build and grow but i also realize younger people have a temptation every time there's a problem sometimes people want to feel that problem with that person mm. and you might want to hire smarter than hire faster um because you and even styles of hiring is this person really worth their salt why start them off on a permanent contract mm Kenya is not friendly to employers. I'm telling you when you hire someone and a lot of countries in Africa, right? In America I'm allowed to fire at will. Mm. But you try that <laughs> stuff here, you find yourself in all manners of tribunals. <laughs> in South Africa you can hardly fire a house help. You know? So before I give you permanent contracts, what are my legal options? So I'm, I'm dealing with cash burn. Yep. So I, I have to start thinking about if I'm going to do a series A and I'm at pre-series what caliber of people do I have now you have a dilemma in your hands the type of people you need to do a good series A are really qualified people mm-hmm. so how do you balance between finding extremely good talent and not having enough cash <laughs> maybe in your pre-series to convince people in your series A that this is a business worth investing in mm-hmm. it's all richard we can't exhaust this conversation here it. but it's all a play around certain benefits from what you call esop employee share options to down to um short term contracts to prove your capabilities um short term contracts to prove to, to to investors that in the event that things don't work out i don't have any liabilities hanging over my head mm. after this experiment yep so i don't have a long term obligation outside of this um i think you need to pay me a million dollars for this <laughs> advice so so yes it it is it is information i've gathered over experience and time it's nothing i, I don't you have to employ you have to bring in the people but i think you can employ it differently and the mm. more you get experience the more you realize this is crucial yeah. i whatsapp whatsapp had 40 employees oh i didn't know that yes all of them had share options the guy made everybody a millionaire mm, mm. bill gates was having a major problem with having capital um and he couldn't pay his employees at some point so he offered some of them shares mm. half of them agreed the other half said no well Oof. someone is smiling right now and <laughs> someone, someone is pissed <laughs> from 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 somebody in fintech what are the must haves uh, cto Or, or for you who who would you be like this one's can't be under contract this one's need um i mean can't be under short term contracts this one's there's a part of the play in the organization and this um, this question i think i'm being a bit stingy on the fintech mm. aspect of it mm. what for you are positions where you're like listen this role is too important for me to joke and i say that because globally that's where the world is going a lot of yeah. people watching this are probably thinking in that space I'll give you a pretty unpopular answer. I think everyone's dispensable including the founder. Um everyone. And then let me clarify that by saying if you start there <laughs> then you actually start at the right place. Ooh. Everyone can go including the founder, including the founder. Everyone can go. Um because there are moments the founder is bad for the business. Mm. Mm-hmm. So if you start there then you will build an organization where everyone understands nobody is indispensable. Is I found a problem when somebody thinks they are indispensable. Mm-hmm. So nobody is. Then you build up from there and decide what can I do to keep good talent. With it understanding it can go. Because mm. <laughs> when you're beholden to someone but then when you finally discover then who must say stay i found 
certain things to mean a lot from share options mm-hmm. to salaries culture to no actually I've, I've found salary is not such a big lever Ooh, okay it's what most people think and I'm of the school of thought that if you can't buy into the vision I'm building and what you want is a big salary then maybe this is not for you because mm. that's already a sign <laughs> that's already a sign a believer in a vision even if they've come from a 10 digit income will say you know what I'll stick my head out for this thing I, there's something here there's something here and then they'll negotiate very well for a good ease of package or mm-hmm. something but they'll buy into the vision so sometimes you'll find people who've come from a career type of environment want to dictate a very high income model to you because you feel you really need that talent mm. um when you're an entrepreneur and when you're a founder and when you're at pre-series stage you're the janitor <laughs> you're everything you're, you're everything true so I agree. don't allow anyone to hold you hostage around the whole aspect of you have to pay me three hundred thousand dollars a year i can't afford you it's been real i don't care how important you are unless you're the one holding the check for my series a <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's just meet later i can't afford you and do it. and do investors come in with condition that a certain cfo comes into the company and this cfo thus demands a certain salary i mean you're talking series a series b type of conversation oh, but okay. at pre-series okay. not necessary okay not necessarily and if you have such an investor at pre-series you need to be worried okay you actually need to be worried because whereas i can understand that there's such a desire you need investors who back you mm-hmm. the founder and put into play all the necessary accountability structures and governance structures that give them comfort about uses of capital and all that but the moment anybody wants to begin driving the business at pre-series stage you're done before you started mm. it's it's i'm not saying it's doom all the way some people could make it work but honestly you you can't be micromanaged at pre-series stage mm. you're already dead then because because things will change what you thought you'll build will change how you thought you'll make money will change you need to be allowed some room for that change to happen and people have to have some patience with you as you build that the moment that's out of the window and you're being told pop 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 that's series b type of conversations mm-hmm. at series b you've got people with a lot of weight that are saying don't change course and if you do there's some punitive ways we will deal with you <laughs> <laughs> that could be if you didn't also put the right founder protections mm-hmm. at the beginning. So I don't think it's a fair thing for an investor to come at that early stage and start telling you, you know, I want to know how much you spent on this computer. It happens. I want to know you know how much toilet paper you're buying. I want to know mm. how how many pens you people are buying. You have a board meeting. Allow me to give a finance report. If not get out of the kitchen. And let me find another investor. And this has frustrated a lot of Kenyans and a lot of African um, startups. Because sometimes you're so desperate for your idea to work, you take money that just torments you. Mm. I, I, I've done that before and I'll never do it again. Ooh. You know, I, I think the magnitude of this conversation is beginning to to dawn on me. And it actually brings me to my next question. You've mentioned the word unicorn a lot. So from a dream perspective, from somebody who's setting up a business, from somebody who's starting a business, where do you break the limitations off for you to even dream of a unicorn? For those who don't know what a unicorn is, he said it before, it's a billion dollar business. Somebody who is seated here is having the conversation and I actually believe that's what you are in the process of building. Mm. So where where does your mentality get to that even at the beginning that you are able to have that dream without it being a fantasy? You know, 
I think the magnitude of this conversation is beginning to to dawn on me. And it actually brings me to my next question. You've mentioned the word unicorn a lot. So, from a dream perspective, from somebody who's setting up a business, from somebody who's starting a business, where do you break the limitations of for you to even dream of a unicorn? For those who don't know what a unicorn is, he said it before, it's a billion dollar business. Somebody who's seated here is having the conversation and I actually believe that's what you are in the process of building. Mm. So where where does your mentality get to that even at the beginning that you are able to have that dream without it being a fantasy? Let me let me let me first say I think Kenya is way overdue for a unicorn. So you're saying we don't have a unicorn in Kenya right now. Not as you and I speak at this point in time. Mm. We don't. And when I say a unicorn, I don't know what the valuation of Safaricom is. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm mm-hmm. not talking about big corporates. Yes, I'm and a Safaricom is not a startup. It's not a startup. Yes. I'm dealing with people that have started a business and eventually worked their way to become a $1 billion business plus. Nigeria in the last three or four years has just had three, four, five. They're just, just <laughs> throwing them out there. And, and some of the businesses Nigerians have begun are businesses that Kenyans began a long time ago. Mm. Um, and you know, with with all humility, Kenya is, without a doubt, a tech force to reckon with in Africa. So, why we don't have a unicorn has a lot to do with either our models of how we look at businesses, how we raise money for those businesses, how we do that. So, the first thing I think that needs to happen, Richard, is that that ceiling needs to be broken. This limitation that it's not possible to have a unicorn or it's never happened before, I don't even have such ambitions. Once it started happening in Nigeria, I mean, even the one that was valued at $1.3 billion or so, Flutterwave eventually, even it's now I think at 3.6 in less than a year, mm. it just keeps happening. Once you, once you reach that, you start going. But at the same time, there are people who have a problem with the fundamentals of those valuations mm. because do the business unit economics really make sense so there, ha- there has to be a balance around unit economics and um and that so i think i pray that in kenya over the next 24 months to 36 months we get to hear of two or three unicorns i really hope i'm one of them mm. <laughs> um, i don't know but we're working hard in that direction because i think for the younger generation once that ceiling is broken you'll start to see them popping up quickly what happens when that ha- when when you have a unicorn the global attention of your country also starts to people start to pay attention so mm-hmm. what has happened in nigeria is a lot of investment banks and groups are paying a lot of attention to nigeria mm. even to africa as a result of some of those companies getting to that point so when we come to kenya it will do something for the younger organizations the younger companies and so groups that i've seen that are helping groups like endeavor that are helping a lot of young companies or younger companies grow scale groups that are looking at connecting opening those doors those become vital Hmm. to the younger generation or those who are starting younger businesses not necessarily younger generation but those who are starting young businesses i believe scale the type of capital, speed to market, all these things factored in together start to make a big difference around reaching that type of status of a unicorn or mm. let's not, if you don't want to be over ambitious, even a business valued at over $50 million, $100 million, it's achievable. It's achievable. It's so achievable, Richard. We just need to support one another, see these things happening in surrounding markets and begin to build in a very smart way. We have to stop building just for Kenya. I was going to, ask, in fact, I was going so, to ask. Sorry to interject, but just to ask you that: Is that then what made you dream? Your perspective yeah. is already. Listen, you have a more African perspective than a Kenyan perspective, where you're like, our brothers are doing this, yeah, yeah. so why can't it be done here? I don't even have an African perspective. So the business I've started has offices in Silicon Valley and in Nairobi. Mm. Why? Why not? It'll cost me as much to have an office in Lagos in rent. (laughs) 
and and the perspectives of how people view you when you do that are different mm. are you with me mm. they're different so 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 i'm sending employees from kenya to america i am and they're gonna build <laughs> and they're building for our business and we're realizing that there's some dynamics that are to our advantage there than here mm. the, the, having the companies registered in delaware and through the silicon valley mm. are better in terms of prospectors for raising capital than they are necessarily for raising money only in africa mm. so there is what i call a lot of lazy capital in africa it wants to see 10 years financial statements, brick and mortar, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I mean, you know, to be honest, it's it's okay, but it's annoying. Yeah. Things have changed. That's like, that's like using, um, let me find the right example because I have to find, that's like using my space for um, communication. <laughs> in today's age <laughs> that's like using uh, Windows 95 yeah. <laughs> for a fintech it's like using a MacBook Pro to write a letter thank you <laughs> more like using an aerogram and then there's a generation that has no idea what I just said <laughs> to write a letter yeah. in 2022 and I'm I'm I've had conversations where people are like um, no I'd rather you know, we'd rather buy a bank. Mm. <laughs> it's digital age. And I'm praying younger people come and disrupt the living daylights out of some of that thinking and change the way a lot of these companies are going to think, right? I mean, who thought? Who thought? I was being told the other day by one of my investors about um, this whole new cyber world. Um, um, what is it called? Oh my goodness, I have to remember. Metaverse. The metaverse. Metaverse, yep. I mean, look at the metaverse. Whoever thought mm. that we will have a virtual world yep. that people are investing heavily in. And so... I own a piece of land in Decentraland. Thank you. <laughs> you see? And, 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 and you start to look at things like that and how, how companies are looking at this and how... And someone is still telling you um, you know, you need to be introduced to our bank by another banker. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Mm. So, so I'm of the school of thought that let's disrupt this thinking. Because for that next generation to get access, and it's the same way I think about real estate, it's the same way I think about housing for the next generation, disrupt what's old. When Safaricom decided to put a cell phone in the hands of a watchman, mm. the game changed. Mm. The moment you are about humanity and making some changes on what it is you really believe in, you will see what will happen. Mm. So I want to see 20 unicorns in Kenya. I want to see 100 unicorns in Kenya. Change the game. Change the game. What are we going to innovate? Open up offices in multiple countries. And now that you can do it virtually, you don't have to have necessarily physical presence, mm. but it does a lot for your story. It really does. Story is key. Story is key. At the same time, you have groups like Twiga that raised their first capital just by having only an Nairobi operation, not even Kenya. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Raised $50 million from Goldman Sachs mm. and, and, and Co., it's public knowledge. I'm not quoting yep. anything there. But they only had business in Nairobi. So it's not necessarily that you have to be in New, New York, York and all. I don't know what you're trying to do, but if you're selling bananas like Twitter and fruits and vegetables and eventually growing to what they've become today, then localization may be very key. Mm. If you're doing fintech and you're looking at solutions, payment gateways, why limit yourself to one market? Flutterwave didn't limit themselves mm. to one market. The whole payment gateway system is globally applicable. Globally applicable. And that's why they get those kind of valuations. So don't give me a payment gateway that can only work with them person. Mm. You've just killed, I mean, this, this fascination with just, even m are trying to be global. <laughs> so build for their global thinking and become a global partner for them and give them global solutions, then you're talking. Hold on. You've mentioned, oh man, you've mentioned something so key there. That's a way, from a business perspective, from a business idea, yeah. what you've talked about is 
figure out what um just to give somebody a business idea there mm. what you've just said like, I, i i don't want to run over it there's an existing corporation entity company business yeah. that is looking for a solution rather than you go and start from scratch to be that business and get the market share and everything come up with a solution sell the solution to them yeah. and become and have a global partner for them and grow by client that's how the ibms of this world grew that's how the kpmgs of this world grew you'll find coca cola in atlanta have a policy maybe i don't know who the auditor is but they'll say our auditors globally are price waterhouse mm. good luck kamau and and richard and sons uh, auditor company trying to get the coca cola contract in kenya you can't they those companies grew by client mm. and so you can grow by client and you can scale by client and you can you can acquire through clients and clients can acquire you with your first company mode yeah that's how you grew you grew by it was my second one oh sorry <laughs> my bad sorry yeah. my bad <laughs> no no it's okay it's okay yeah. with 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 modes part of your growth across the con- continent yeah. was because of your partnership with yes. airtel yes Yes, so Airtel grows, MTN uh, Airtel says go to other markets, I go. MTN says go to other markets, we go. Yeah, but you are also not exclusive with one with one partner. No. No. So you grow, you grow by client, you grow by um sometimes acquisition, you grow by partnerships. Mm. You can you can scale based on how you strategize your scale strategy and you can also decide you don't want to grow outside of your market but you're making enough happen in that market you're do, looking at depth of that customer base mm-hmm. and decide i want to drill into this customer base until i have 80% and not 20% i'm not in the shallow end of my customer integration and relationship i'm at deep end status 80% i've drilled into richard until 80% of him uses me yep yeah <laughs> i get it yeah So far come I've done a good job with that. Exactly. Exactly. My question as as we transition, but I just want to ask this one more from the investor perspective. Again, you're right. We can spend seven years talking about <laughs> just the investor conversation. Yeah. Uh, but I want us to touch on other things. African investment. Mm. Has that opened up? Is is there a Africans investing in Africa? I've heard you talk about American investment and Europe investment. Is are we improving? or does a young person starting a business i mean a, a fintech company have to immediately start looking outside african investment mm. has that opened up is is there a africans investing in africa i've heard you talk about american investment and europe investment is are we improving or does a young person starting a business i mean a, a fintech company have to immediately start looking outside i'll tell you a truth that will shock you i, I think <laughs> let, me, let me let let me let, let me tell it tell you and then you decide whether you're getting shocked <laughs> or not i think africans can be very um diverse in their mannerisms and their loyalties and their um patriotism you will find some of the reasons the nigerian narrative is really working globally is because the guys running some of the investment banks in new york are nigerian second generation mm. Are you with me? I'm with you. They are second generation westernized. Mm. But they feel we have to do something for home. Yep. Um and therefore they link up with their brothers who are doing great things and they make it happen. Mhm. I'm not telling you about Kenya. So we as Kenyans I think have a fundamental I don't say Kenyans it's Nigerians are unique in the way they look out for each other and a few African countries are like that. You will find maybe even Egyptians behave like that. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. People from different parts of Africa, but Kenyans don't behave like that. We we are not um as um loyal as far as 
I'm in New York. I'm running an investment bank. I want to make something happen for Richard because he's a Kenyan. Mm. The Ubuntu. That ubuntu -ness. Kenyans are like every man for themselves and God for us. I, I don't want to generalize. Yep. It's not fair. But I just want to tell you, in that world, what I've seen mm. is there is a s desire by a Nigerian working at JP Morgan or, or at, 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 at Citibank to raise another Nigerian. Mm. It's not necessarily the case for us. So Africans investing in Africans is an interesting theory, but I can tell you African influences, influencing African investments, it's happening. Fafanua, mm -hmm. <laughs> expound. So these people who sit in very influential offices in very large investment banks or family offices are actually consciously saying, yeah, 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 we've made 18 investments, but let's make two of them African. Mm -hmm. um, that's happening. Okay. Africans with money investing in Africans, it's happening. The scale, or rather, let me not say the scale, it may be happening a lot because of small investments, but the quantums we're talking about there are not significant. Okay. And therefore, they don't tilt the needle much as far as quantum is concerned. They may tilt the needle as far as volume is concerned, mm -hmm. but not quantum of capital. I get it. Yeah, so you may find NGOs, um, small companies. I give a guy $25,000 to build a business. He lost it all. That kind of vibe exists a lot in mm. Africa. But we've put $10 million into Richard, and we believe in what he's building and where he's going. Mm -mm. No. Okay. No. The people investing in those people are not Africans. <laughs> Answered. Answered very well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let me. It's changing. It's changing. There's an awareness. You're seeing a lot of these savannah type funds and stuff like It's changing. But we're still a little bit far from it maturing. Oh. It's not yet there. Even the funds, some of these African funds are running, are not funds from Africa. Mm. They are directed at Africa, but they're not necessarily from Africans. Yeah. 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 Which is fine. I mean, I guess that kind of money, people don't have it here. And where it's coming from then, I guess we have to figure out how to tap into it so that we become eventually those that build the continent. As the unicorns come, the unicorns then begin to invest back home. You create an ecosystem of philanthropists, um, investors, influencers, people that can convince. I mean, I saw Bill Gates at Dangote's daughter's wedding. He was <laughs> sitting there. Why was Bill Gates sitting at Dangote's daughter's wedding? You think it's because Dangote has a nice name. <laughs> it's because he's a billionaire. Mm. <laughs> you can... So... You go with him to the office and you pass by his office in Lagos. Uh, he's with Bill Gates and he says, Bill, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to do one to them. Bill says, that's a good idea. What do you think we should do? You don't get those type of, you don't get that kind of attention um, when you're not, an, you, you don't get the influencer's attention when you yourself are not an influencer. Mm. So I think when you hear people like Strife Masiwa talk about what they're doing with Bill Gates, or with Bill and, you know, ex-wife Melinda, it's because they're, they're, they're some of the top African philanthropists and these people want to work with philanthropists. You talk about how will you get the ear of the Slim family to do something in Africa? Um, how do you get the ear of the Catholic Relief Services to fund more of these younger youth startups and all? The right people need to be having the right conversation. Mm. So when the unicorns are there, if you go right now and you say you are the first unicorn out of Nigeria, uh, you have someone's attention. Yep. <laughs> Completely <laughs> changes the attention. And what that does the is posture. that we change this whole, there's not much talk of unicorns in America because there's so many. It's still there, but there's so many. But in Africa, oh man, this has to change. The, the Forbes list of Africa needs to start changing seen the same names for <laughs> for a couple of years mm. okay and did you know there's no kenyan actually on that list is there there's no kenyan on the forbes top 100 
I would I would wonder whether one name needs to be added <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> there's one that I know should definitely be there. <laughs> <laughs> but we we'll leave that for a different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this. You 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 talked about fail quickly. Uh when you were when you were speaking about um entering a pioneer's market. I've got I've got another question for you. As the founder of, of the business, yeah. when do you know when to close the business? So for example, you've set up this business and like when is it like no no no, this is a bad idea, shut down. I feel like there are too many failure businesses Still operating open. or <laughs> and I and I don't want to hit on them and just say no 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 I'm I'm not sure about this when when should you be like okay call it quits As the founder of, of the business yeah. when do you know when to close the business so for example you've set up this business and like when is it like no 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 this is a bad idea shut down i feel like there are too many failure businesses Still operating open. or yeah. <laughs> and i and i don't want to hit on them and just say no 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 i'm i'm not sure about this when when should you be like okay call it quits there's a book i read called hope is not a strategy <laughs> <laughs> very interesting insights in that book um <sighs> yeah There's, there's hope is there's, not a strategy but hope is so crucial for business isn't it no, no, it's crucial it's not a strategy okay, that's okay. the truth it's yeah. not a strategy you can't you can't eat hope right um even biblically hope um sandwiches faith and love you know it, it hangs on to something it, it it has to it's a very important ingredient extremely important uh, but at some point it has to turn into tangible mm results right even the bible says hope deferred makes the heart weak mm. it can cause someone to faint when something just is always looking like it there and it's just never there it's not making I, it i've been there richard i've been there and so you ask a very important question there's certain fundamental things someone has to say to themselves huh eh? there's there's some There's some things you have to look yourself in the mirror and and just say let's have a conversation <laughs> with, with, with me <laughs> right it's not making sense it's taking up all my savings it's finishing the money um it seems to be digging a deeper deeper hole i can't find investors i'm i'm funding the business constantly it's never funding me mm. it's been x amount of time it's causing me extreme pain with my spouse it's i work for my business mm. right i go to work it's a part time thing but it's the one eating everything just lay it down mm. yeah, because i'll tell you some some businesses can take four years to make a profit but depending on the strategy of what you decided to do from a funding perspective all it it has money coming in to help it run mm. right you can't survive on a loss on a perpetually loss making business perpetually I like that perpetually loss making no matter what you do you also can't survive on a business whose fundamentals are constantly on a perpetual string of fundraising mm. especially when you do, you're not fundraising properly so you keep raising less than what you need and you're back to raising now to, to do the unicorn you're constantly on a fundraising perspective series a series b by the time you're done with pre-series it's time to start series a it's time to start series b but you have a plan mm. i'm talking about that bakery where you just literally are borrowing money to pay salaries every every month mm. for the next three years Um, and the business is not even making the money to not making the yeah. money so what is it you're going to do different so you must have those fundamental conversations with yourself is this just passion you know i, I go for some talks and i hear people being motivated so hard i mean that line of speaking to people but i'm careful you know you you can't motivate me to be a good businessman i'm either good or i'm not mm. <laughs> you know what i mean you, you can't pump me up 
and say, don't worry, it's not, it's, it's going to, it's going to work. I come from a school of thought where I think it's time, sometimes you have to have an honest conversation with you. Mm. No, it's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. Um, this business is dead. And how do I know? How long have I had to self-fund? How long have I looked for investors and they're not coming? How long do I? And sometimes it's good to also decide, let me pack it for now. You see where we are a year from now while I try and rework and rethink my strategy. Sometimes that tension in a business comes so that you pivot. Mm. Pivoting meaning change direction completely. Mm. What you thought you were gonna do, it's not working. And so you have to be on your, I told you when we started, the very powerful thing that can happen to someone is reaching a point of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And self-awareness is where you have to be frank enough with yourself to say that the prodigal son in the Bible, he came to his senses mm -hmm. after a lot of struggle came to his senses. There's, there's a moment you have to come to your senses and say, I don't think this is working. I don't think I was cut out to be a businessman. Let me go get a career. In fact, I've stopped encouraging people to be entrepreneurs. I'm seeing people are having entrepreneurial classes. <laughs> entrepreneurs are, have you ever met someone who's a, they have a farmer's hand? Mm. Yeah. Entrepreneurship is like that. You, you have to have the hand for it. If, if, let's I love that you've gone into this place. Explain what it is because what have you and and, and, and this one I want to hear from your experience. What has been an entrepreneur meant to you or done to you? Yeah. Let me ask you, Richard, you you long time ago were involved in music. Do you think you are an exceptionally good singer? I think I was good. Oh, well, you're a good rapper. No, I mean, good rapper. Rapper. Definitely not a singer. <laughs> Definitely not a singer. Yeah. That's entrepreneurship. Just know your lane. Mm. Just know your lane. Um, and the earlier you just get to accept it, the better. There are things you can't fake. You can't fake it. I've come to accept it. Mm. I know in entrepreneurship what my strength is. I know that I'm not sure I'm the best administrator, but I know I'm a pretty darn good innovator. Mm. I know how to put the pieces together and bring a business out, but I'm constantly looking for my right-hand person who's a very good administrator. Mm. Because if you don't know your blind spot, if you don't have self-awareness, you can't pump yourself up about your weaknesses <laughs> you you will mess people's money and you'll burn a lot of bridges and some of this stuff is extremely unforgiving yeah? Mm. yeah you know this is life it's not a rehearsal yep when you take people's money it's um it's expected to work it's expected to work for them yes it can go wrong yes things can happen yes there are risks yes things can morph into what you never imagined but if you know you did your very best with that awareness, then it's important. So you've been a con you've been a career person all your life. That's what is so good. You're so good at it. And one day you wake up and you want to be an entrepreneur because you're attending an entrepreneurial class. It will it could work, but it will shock the living daylights out of you. I've seen that movie quite a few times. Mm -hmm. Four or five parts of that movie. Qua, qua ground vitu ni different. It's different. <laughs> hey, it's different. The difference so, between theory and practical. Yeah, and sometimes you may want to come and handle or take over the business when you're when it's at career type of stage. You know what I mean? Yep. Like you, you've allowed the entrepreneur to do the hard groundwork. Mm -hmm. Then you come and continue at the point where it feels like a career type of, you know, I need to have important meetings. There. But let the right people till the ground and let the right people plant the seeds and let the right people prune the fruit, <laughs> prune the trees. If you are gifted to be all those things, well done. Mm. But very few people, very few people have that. Very few. I was in a meeting with 
I was humbled enough to be in a room where we are selected about three businessmen from the world to go have a very serious session with Bill Gates. And the people in the room that were talking to him, man, I was so confused. I was so confused because those guys were completely confident in their subject matter and didn't, they did not care that they're talking to Bill Gates. Mm. They were telling him like it is that, you know, the problem with you is you're arrogant. You're just a guy who I was sitting there saying, oh my God, I can't imagine this conversation with an African entrepreneur, an African billionaire. What did you say? Mm. <laughs> he was there taking it all. I don't think it's going to work. It sounds stupid. It sounds very, it's not thought through properly. What's wrong with you, Bill? What are, I'm like, wow. The maturity of conversation mm. I was hearing in that room. I admired it, you know. I'm like, I don't know, you know. Sometimes I've been told by people who've worked near me, I'm a bit intimidating in the office, you know. I'm like, I want to be like that. I want you to talk to me like that. <laughs> Just be bold. Call mm. it out. Mm. Tell, I have tough skin. Tell me what you want to tell me. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm very careful not to take this madness home. You know? <laughs> Sometimes my wife says I'm very soft. I'm like, yeah, you want this side. You want this side of me because the other side, the other side can take a beating, you mm. know. And uh, it's taken time, but I can take, I can take a boardroom beating. I can, I can, and wake up the next day and go for lunch with that person. I'm easy. I've had people who've told me, I think the idea you're building, you stole my idea. I can have lunch with that person and say, okay, let's have this conversation. What would you, <laughs> you know, it's down to execution. How did I execute? How did you execute? What is the issue? How, well, you, you find all manner of, just be an entrepreneur, man. It's like putting your face out every day for people to slap mm. and for you to say thank you. Hi. <laughs> 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 Boss. I love it. Let me ask. There's something I don't know if I answered your question. Ah, you've answered it. No, it's okay. okay. You, you. I mean, what you've done is paint a picture that it's not rosy and it's not textbook yeah. and it's not theory. Yeah. And there's some only there's some stuff that you will only learn in the practical. Yeah. Now let me ask this: as somebody who's built, you're the one who started in the trenches. You are the entrepreneur. You're the one who Yanni. You built that thing, that mm. mud hut with your own hands. You get. When is it time? for you to know that you are becoming the hindrance to the growth of the business when when um when do you stop being mr know-it-all now let me ask this as somebody who's built you're the one who started in the trenches you are the entrepreneur you're the one who yanni you built that thing that mud hat with your own hands you get when is it time for you to know that you are becoming the hindrance to the growth of the business when when um when do you stop being mr know-it-all does that are you, are you yeah, get my question i am rather than you now stay there and that business dies because you refuse to leave down to self-awareness richard if i can give advice to any young person read books on self-awareness early enough mm. Find people that will train you and mentor you on self-aware. Forget this pump up mentorship of you're gonna make it. Just you know, you know, you know that's a cheering squad. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm mm -hmm. talking about hard truths about yourself. Like, um, am I short-tempered? Am I arrogant? How am I in a room with people? How am I? Um, what's my vibe mm -hmm. when people are around me? Is it trust? Is it, do I just leave a bad taste in people's mouths? You need to know. Mm. You, you may not change it, but you need to know it. Mm. I'll tell you, that is an asset that people underestimate. You gotta know, am I the best? I was in front of a banker, very senior banker in this country. Amazing person. I love that person. And, you know, but somewhere in the meeting, I realized he was digging the vibe of my CFO more than my vibe. Mm. I shut up. I kept quiet. Kamba say, keep quiet as if you've gone. <laughs> <laughs> keep quiet as if you've gone. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. I shut up. 
and I let the man have his day. Self-awareness. Mm. Because I had been with someone who said the problem with you is when people come into the room, you, 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 since you're the founder, you want them to know it's you, you're the one. You're the... No, sometimes the magic is happening with someone else from your office. What's the end game? What do you want? They've fallen in love with the other person, let it roll and chill the living daylights out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can just let the other person shine. It's hard, but self-awareness will start to bring out these things about, do you interrupt people while they talk? Is that your nature? Because there are people who hate that. In fact, there are investors who see that in you and back off. When they're talking to you and you want to finish the thing they are saying before they finish, the jack of all trades type of, are you self-aware? So. At which point do you know you're bad for the business? If you're self-aware, you'll know. In fact, you'll set the business up to make sure your weaknesses are taken care of. Mm. <laughs> mm. Because you're self-aware. You, know you know your blind spots. Now, you can become self-aware by experience, which is painful, or you can become self-aware by submitting yourself to people who can tell you and help you know how to deal with your blind spots and also how to deal with your strengths mm. yeah are you the right storyteller about the business if you sit in front of investors are you the guy that just gives guys a particular vibe because it matters you go on road shows and you're boring as hell <laughs> people buy into the entrepreneur not just the numbers not just the numbers they buy into this guy you know is he exciting is she exciting but if you're dozing at your own story <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm not saying they, they, they want you to be excited, but mm. they start, all of us give out a vibe. You've got to figure out what vibe you give out. The people open their mouths and can't be trusted. Like There's nothing they've done to show someone they can't be trusted. Mm. But there's a vibe that people are just like, I don't know, man. There's <laughs> something. Something, man. You know, the last <laughs> interview you and I did, I think there was a guy who was like, I don't trust this guy. There's something about <laughs> yeah. to that person. I had a vibe, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they didn't think I'll build my homes. They should come and see them getting built now. <laughs> now and then we'll get you with, a, with yeah, time. We, with time, we'll talk about this. With, yeah. But the point I'm trying to make is: first of all, congratulations. Thank you. On Thank you. Beulah City. It's important that we know, yeah. and not just Beulah City. When yeah. Idomex, everything else that you're Asante. building. Uh, Asante. When the time is right, I'm sure you'll be back here for yeah. us to have a conversation we'll talk about, about those that. things. Today is today is about this. Yeah. very hard subject yep. about capital and entrepreneurs uh, and all i love it but you will know when you're self-aware what you're not good at and what you're good at and that is an asset every entrepreneur needs to take time to ask some very even jesus asked who do people say i am self-awareness okay Hey man, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, <laughs> I'll do a hard stop at two hours. Okay. Uh, remember, we will we'll keep doing these conversations. Yeah. Okay. What do you pick? How do you pick your board members? And who and why are board members even important to you? But yeah. how do you pick them? What do you pick? How do you pick your board members? And who and why are board members even important to you? But yeah. how do you pick them? Um, end game. What's your end game? So again, mom and pop shop. Whenever I say mom and pop shop, I'm talking about you and your wife or you alone are building a thing where you have no intention of ever scaling. Mm. And then you can decide the board is you and your wife. Um, <laughs> or just you. <laughs> you're the chairman and you're the CEO. But on this other side, if you want to scale, for instance, to this unicorn type of status, mm. you pick a board that takes you there. Mm. And sometimes board is dictated by the type of capital you got. Sometimes you don't have a choice because maybe the capital you went after dictates that at a particular amount or at a particular stakeholding of the business, they 
deserve a board seat, mm. maybe a board and observer, maybe two board seats. So sometimes it's dictated by what you raised. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's dictated by where you're going, your end game. So it depends. When you have too many investors, it can pollute your boardroom. Mm. It can pollute your governance. But if you are adamant that you have a particular end game and with that end game you're going to build a governance team that helps you get there then such people they're rare to find but they're there what they do they actually help you build towards that direction mm -hmm. and again down i can't i don't know today i've really emphasized on this self-awareness i love it you then are able to take their critique and information and understanding not personally you're firm about your decisions you're okay to agree to disagree on certain things because you don't put a board together to have yes men mm. and yes women. No, you're, you've put a board together to drive something a particular direction. Mm. So I'd say you need to pick a team that will take you where you're going. How many people should be in a board? You can have a unicorn with five board members and you can have a kiosk with 11 board members. Mm. <laughs> How smart are you at picking the team you need to take you where you need to go? Is is this then the difference between the board of directors and the advisory board? Yes, yes there's a distinct difference. A board of directors can be dictated heavily by the kind of money you raised and all. Uh, and if you raise the right type of money, then it's actually the, the right board to take you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in my case, I have two board members from the capital race. Uh -huh. And then I have three board slots for value-driven board members who you want to select particular caliber of people that have the right influence, have the right um, direction, mm. have the right status to help you get there. So the other three for me are Americans. Mm. And I've left those slots for them so that as we fill those slots, these become people with enough influence to help us close Series A, Series B and become that unicorn. Oh, that's powerful. So what I'm hearing, you've got three open slots right now. Yeah. But you've got you've got an understanding of who you want to take those slots yeah. up. Yeah, we're interviewing, we're talking, we're checking out. We've asked a few people. They've said yes, but we're just finalizing. So, you know, those are people who you know they've done... You know, one of the people we've talked to has raised over a billion dollars for his fund and whatever. So he knows enough people. They bring a lot of value to your board. Mm. Um, sometimes this is a conversation that's hard because sometimes people have already formed their boards. Mm. So let me preempt a different question. What do you do if the board is already formed? Well, do you have tenures or are these forever board members? If you have tenures and you want to transition, Maybe transition half of them out mm. if they don't bring you the value you need to or explain to them that you need to bring in the right people for the next phase of where the business needs to go. That's important. Boards, boards can kill a business. Mm. Boards can kill a business. And sometimes some of the board members you bring are professional board members. Mm. All they love to do is be on a board. But do they bring value to where you're going? I have a friend who just had amateurs on his board, but they were people. When I say amateurs, it's people who just never used to be on too many boards, mm. but they understood, they had networks, they were building their own businesses. They connected this guy to so many, his business now valued at $250 million in just three years. Mm. And those people had never served on other boards. So it's not really... It's good to have experienced people, but mix your people. So I'm in fintech. I'm going to get fintech people on my board, not a teacher. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And fintech people with the right yeah. connections. If I'm building an education app, maybe I might need a teacher on my board, a very well thought a teacher. Who knows. So who's on your board and why? You have to ask yourself that question. It's not for decoration. It's very purposeful. It's very, very crucial to have the right people there and they must make time for the business mm. they must make time and when you're getting these board members for example the advisory boards the equity conversation is not a part of this mm -hmm. it's not not at all okay not at all for what <laughs> but, <laughs> but and, and also so unless they are sitting on the board as 
part of the equity, equity they already got yes. and it dictates that a particular stakeholding requires a board seat yes mm. but others need to be value driven okay and you give them compensation or you find a way to compensate them monetarily mm. or whichever way for their sitting allowances but no you don't you could give equity if you want maybe you have you know a very very influential person um 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 you you could have an extremely influential person that you feel if i put this one on my board it opens very serious doors i'll give them 1% of the business mm. but don't be naive okay the reason why i asked that would be then what would be the motivation for the board members to then open up their networks for you um but probably what i was asking is how do you keep the board members then motivated to give value to the business yeah. and not just attend a sitting attend a meeting like yeah. always happens just for the sitting allowance that's why you have to really vet and know the type of people you want there you, richard there are amazing human beings out there mm. the fact that you could be building a unicorn will attract a certain caliber of people who want to be a part of your story okay and are moved by your values and character and systems that they say i don't mind being a part of this story mm. i'm happy to utilize my time towards something of this sort i'd love to have my name attached to this kind of product that's it you will be shocked that there are people who say okay you have my attention and these are ceos of very large companies that are telling you i'm interested so put your feelers out there and let what you're building have value because a lot of these guys are now driven by impact by value by what 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 are you changing mm. in the world what's going to change because of what you're doing so right now with what you've done with CTA you know even what you're putting together you'll be surprised you'd be happy to be on your board mm. people you never thought would want to sit on your board you'll be shocked they're like what you're doing is making a difference some of these people have reached actualization stage mm -hmm. of life they're no longer driven by money they're driven by you changing the world and i want to be a part of what you're doing that's it so <sighs> what what are you what are you building but if you're just bottom line driven i just want money 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 then you'll also attract those kind of people Mm. And those are usually the most painful people to have on your board because when you're not making money, who hmm. sips water? Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, just two more questions and definitely. Yeah. Uh, well, um, so what role does passion play in making entrepreneurial in, in well, while making your entrepreneurial de decisions? And I'd also add and say maybe as a as the next question kingdom yeah. you here said you're unapologetically uh, kingdom driven by that i mean christian what then also is the balance between uh, being a nutter christian and <laughs> and bringing those values of christianity to business in a real way So what role does passion play in making entrepreneurial in, in well, while well, making your entrepreneurial de decisions and I'd also add and say maybe as a as the next question kingdom yeah. you here said you're unapologetically uh, kingdom driven by that I mean Christian what then also is the balance between uh, being a nutter Christian and <laughs> and bringing those values of christianity to business in a real way so the passion in that so um let me start with passion so passion is passion if i remember well comes from a greek word maxo is it greek yes maxo it literally means to uh, it means to wear the shoes of to be in the shoes of what you're looking at it means to be one with what you're looking at like i am 
um, there's an element of compassion, an element of um, awareness. There's an element of so because of those people I've seen who build value-driven businesses, value like like this is more than money for me. This is really down to the change I'll make in the world, the things I'll do for people. There are people who buy it. So that passion is to become one with what you're doing. Mm. And it plays a very big part because people can tell these sniffers <laughs> can sniff mm. when there's a disconnect between what you're saying and what you're doing. Passion doesn't allow you to separate the two. Mm. Passion, passion enables you to really be sold out. Whether or not money comes, you'll find me doing my best to do something in this area. I didn't start talking fintech yesterday. Mm. I've been talking fintech for the last 18 years. I believe in it. I don't talk data just to get people excited about big data. I've been talking data for 18 years. I think I've earned a right to be heard in that particular. I'm passionate about what data can do for people and how you can bring good products and um, change people's lives because of that. I, I believe in it. So when I tell my stories, it's there. It's there. It's 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 written in the thing. So um, that said, let me answer you on the Christian part I struggle if I can be very honest with you with the Christian narrative mm. and I want to be careful on this subject but I I struggle with the Christian narrative because we are so passionate about being Christians um, should I say we are zealous about being Christians but we are not sometimes willing to have the knowledge of uh, what it means to be a Christian in the marketplace. Mm. So I take the passion of a particular scripture or the zeal I have towards a particular scripture, but I don't know how to wholesomely. So my Christianity will not raise funds. Mm. Go pray as much as you want. What God needs is a person with the knowledge the whole element of scholars in subject matter in Christianity is costing us a lot. So we go with zeal and start real estate companies and go with zeal and start because God is with me. But even God requires a sharpened axe. <laughs> you won't be his battle axe when you're not sharpened. Mm. And when the Bible says iron sharpens iron, you have to understand for you as iron to be sharpened, you must be losing iron. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it's painful and it takes. So we, the Christian narrative, here in my case, as I speak to you, Richard, in all, I'm saying this in all humility, is we have very many disappointed Christian entrepreneurs. But when I sit, I can tell you what happened you started completely unprepared. Hmm. He says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed. <laughs> Rightly dividing the word of truth, which means if I'm going to enter a field, the word of, this is not a scripture for pastors mm -hmm. only. That's a scripture for people who are going to enter anything. Even when God needed to make the, 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 the temple, he was very descriptive about who should do what. Mm. He says to Moses, build according to the pattern. God is obsessed with patterns. Don't just start doing things. Be very precise. Be very particular. Right? If we're going to go have a legal argument on television, don't send a bishop mm. who doesn't understand law and wants to come and tell me about the Constitution. Mm. Bring a Christian lawyer mm. who can make a good case for the Christian body. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I'm getting it. And therefore the Christian narrative in the area of business capital raising, you know, you'll hear things like, we need a Christian bank. No, no, there's no such thing as a Christian bank. 
There's no such thing. It's my view. It's my humble view, but I'm very opinionated strongly about it. Although opinions are the lowest level of knowledge, <laughs> but I'm very opinionated about it. I don't think there's anything like a Christian bank. I don't think there's anything like a Christian media. There's Richard who is a Christian who is running media. Hmm. There's Anthony who is a Christian who has started a bank. He has fulfilled all the, res all the right um, things with the regulator mm. to begin and has proven to know what he's doing, then let's back him as a Christian. But there's no building that is called a Christian. Mm. <laughs> so if we're going to come out and capital raise, let the investment bankers who are Christians come out and start telling people in churches how to prepare themselves for capital raise processes. Let those of us who've come out and built businesses come out and tell the honest truth to people about how rough the streets are. They are rough. They are rough. <laughs> they are rough. It's not a joke. And, and you know, all this depression and some of the stuff is because we've pumped you up so much to come into this marketplace. But when you come here, you realize, hey, we took our ground. <laughs> Different. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so I'm... I'm a proponent of a different Christian narrative. Let's have forums for honest conversations. Whether those are with people who are experts in things to do with marriage and want to tell you the real truth about marriage, or business and want to tell you the real truth about business and what to expect. But don't go for a career thinking because you are a Christian, you will be excused from excellence. Mm. And then say, God was not with me. No, God was with you, but you are unprepared. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the best when they were compared with all the other students. Mm -hmm. They were the best. Mm -hmm. God could work with that. We've got to become good at what we do. We've got to become good at what we do. The Christian narrative has to change. Mm -hmm. If we're going to build houses, let's build the best ones. Let people look and say, that's nice. a Christian. That's a, Christ, that's a project done by Christians. Not look and just find Mabatis and all the structures that we have are just Mabatis everywhere. And there's nothing godly about what we're doing. That's, that's my stand. And just to preempt the Bula conversation, I know for a fact that part of the people who you've used in terms of the construction of the B of Beulah yeah. Beulah yeah. City yeah. which is a real estate project that you're working on yeah which is groundbreaking but yes. you've used the best the best the best and it was intentional the narrative whether or not they're Christian you use the best not just the best the houses are the best priced in urban settings and I don't need to be greedy to make money we've got to perpetuate our value system into what we do. Mm. We have to. Okay. Love it. I know the Bila conversation is eating people, but don't worry, guys. <laughs> I promise you the time will come for that conversation to happen. As promised. Okay. Prom okay, now, now for real, there are two more questions. Okay. Okay. How do you motivate yourself, especially after failure or while you are in this process of, I've just shut down my business, the thing about you, <laughs> you are the perfect candidate to have this conversation. <laughs> what makes you keep getting back up? Because you've had some epic failures in terms, and I put that in quotes, yeah, yeah. in terms of you've, you've had, you have the perfect excuse to quit. Yeah. Yeah. How do you motivate yourself, especially after failure or while you are in this process of i've just shut down my business the thing about you <laughs> you are the perfect candidate to have this conversation <laughs> what makes you keep getting back up because you've had some epic failures in terms and i put that in quotes yeah, yeah. in terms of you've, you've had you have the perfect excuse to quit yeah yeah um The different ways to look at it. So my, my first company is still there and, and and doing very well. I'm not a part of it, but it's there. Um, 
there were good lessons to learn there. My second company is still there. It's actually growing, <laughs> right? And, um, and, and the third company is here. Everything has been a step in the right direction, right? Um, are there things I've tried and the timing was wrong? Yes, I tried farming, the timing was wrong. Mm. Uh, but as far as how to stay focused, I have an end game. I have an end game in mind and that end game is I will build a unicorn. Mm. That's my end game. I love that you're saying it even before it's done. Yes, I will build So right now currently you don't have grace yeah. and God's help. Yes. Yeah. Currently I don't have. Currently as we speak right now you don't have a unicorn. No, I don't. Yeah. Not yet. Yes, and and that's important to say because somebody yeah. watching this in yeah. 2060 let me tell you something. I have a friend who went to 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 um um, they put together this amazing thing. Um, there's a board I sit on and they have this Harvard class and um, one of my friends went and she came back last year but one and she said she, she, she was the um, act, she was the MD then and she said Julian it's interesting that in this class of people who've built unicorns there are people from all over the world in this Harvard class and I want to I want to demystify something. So unicorns are not in tech necessarily. You can have an agriculture unicorn, mm. right? It's it's about the value of the business. And she said it's interesting that a lot of these people built their first unicorn in their early 50s, Ooh. mid 50s and early 60s. Then their second unicorns also in their mid 50s and early 60s. And some of them, very few of them in their late 40s. I want to remove the notion in our minds that everybody is going to be a Mark Zuckerberg. Mm. Not everybody can build a billion dollar organization at 26. Mm. <laughs> so first of all, that's that's a you can count the them right? on one hand. <laughs> yes. That's a misnomer. It's not the norm. It's an anomaly. It's an anomaly. Mm. It's 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 what you wouldn't count as normal. The real normal thing for people to reach that level of business is in their late 40s and their 50s. Mm. So first of all, everybody stop short circuiting process. Mm. <laughs> take your time. Yes, do what you have to do. Uh, what you have to do quickly, do it. But take your time because you're going to have to do the time. And these were guys from Brazil, Mexico, America, right? S- Spain, different parts of the world. And they were there. And they've built unicorns. Some of them on their third unicorn. Right? Because after at some point building the next one, <laughs> once you build your first unicorn, the next time you announce I'm starting a company, you have funders from everywhere wanting to back you. So it gets easier. But the first one and the first successful business in terms of even now I've raised money because my businesses were not they were successful. Mm. Hey Richard, you don't build a business in twenty eight markets as a joker. <laughs> you don't really you don't. don't. You don't. It takes everything it takes a lot i had an amazing co-founder we built this thing together it is tough so as i build now i have experience now right now as i speak to you the people inviting me to 10 countries i'm not interested i'm saying i'm focused on what i know is going to work what i know is going to work they're already inviting you to scale to 10 i have i have (laughs) thorough invitations i could be in 10 countries if i wanted to in less than six months that experience will never ever disappear are you with me with you so the thing is i motivate myself by staying true to the cause of what i believe i was called to do Mm. first i was called to help settle people change a narrative on how housing is viewed by people the same way that they got a cell phone into a watchman's hands i think there's a day it should not be a testimony to have a basic need Mm. house (laughs) home Mm. right as far as access to credit and access to finance is concerned, it should not be punitive for a person who is um, not in the top echelons of society to access credit. They should not be punished for accessing credit. They should not be, it should not be a punitive cost for that person to access credit. Are you with me? With you. And therefore, in in looking at what's the value that drives the things you do, if there's value, if there's a value system, 
the rest will organize itself. Mm. So stay true to the cause. I am constantly going back to God to help me rediscover me, becoming more self-aware, becoming more um, sincere with myself, <laughs> um, and also exposing myself to the right material, the right material to read, the right material to, and also the right people. That's actually a very important piece. So you meet amazing people in, in life, but I'm discovering, I'm making investments in very particular conversations and types of people. And that helps me, helps me grow and stay sane. Mm. And, and I, I, keep, I keep at my true fundamental, which is I'm, I'm teaching the word of God and I want to be the first disciple of everything I teach. Mm. Yes. I'll stick just one more time on this failure. And just because I'm thinking of an entrepreneur whose business may have shut down yeah. or COVID may have even ended yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. Um, emotionally, yeah. I love I love yeah. the fact that you've, you've got this focus that probably drives you. Yeah. But how do you get out of the emotional? Because uh, that's now the killing point, to it's be honest. It's devastating. It's devastating to lose something you've worked on for long. It's devastating. Mm -hmm. It's, you can lose your mind. That's the truth. You can lose your mind. You can lose energy to wake up. In fact, at that vulnerable point, many people make very desperate mistakes. Mm. You'll find that's when people will go try out tenders <laughs> quickly. Just seasoned entrepreneurs, they start doing, you'll start wanting to do crazy things because now you're trying to make up for loss and that's a moment of a thorough sanity check yeah? because it's devastating first you get filled with a lot of fear you get filled with anxiety hmm. but I want to tell people this and this I've seen I've seen it happen please don't lose your sanity you don't have the luxury of going nuts mm. <laughs> the only way to recover is to first make sure you don't go nuts so first you have to keep your sanity whatever has happened has happened it's gone keep your head focused because if you don't get back in the game you're dead number two don't try to do something you're not good at the thing that failed is probably what you're good at mm. You gave it enough time, it was gaining momentum, something happened that just crushed it. There's a treasure in there. You know, you go you go back fishing in the same lake, right? Jesus went, told Peter to go back fishing. He didn't question him. He was an expert fisherman. <laughs> but he said, I've told all night, nevertheless, at your word. And he went back to the same lake to fish, and this time he caught. And sometimes we just need a different mindset, a different word to go back to the same waters and we'll catch. So I want to encourage someone who may be there to say, look, you may feel like the world has come from under your feet, but please, please hear me clearly. Don't lose your mind. Become very self-aware right now. Catch yourself. Catch yourself. Stop snapping at your spouse or whoever you're snapping at. Catch yourself. The thing can be built again. It's really just a matter of time. If you take what you've thought through and built, when I woke up and decided I'm building again, I was able to raise enough money faster than I've ever raised. <laughs> Yet, I was busy looking down on myself. So I want you to know it's possible to get back in the ring, but use your experience and be honest with people about it. Don't try to camouflage it. Be honest with people about it so that they can trust you from the get go, mm. because chances are they'll have done their homework if they're going to fund you. And don't, don't exaggerate truths. Just be honest with yourself, but get back into your game. Richard, that will keep you sane is to see it beginning to work again <laughs> mm. that's one of the things you can do for yourself if that's not possible then get something to do 
and get your hands busy. Mm. Uh, just don't stay idle. It will eat you and you will sink into a depression faster than any midnight train. Uh, you will sink into a depression. Don't don't play with this thing. It'll kill you. Mm. And by the way, five years can go just like that. Just like that. You can be idle for five years and not realize and your flavor will no longer be as appealing mm. when you come back you'll be talking a very old game mm. when the world has moved on so the longer you take to reinvent yourself the more stale you're becoming the world is moving at such a fast pace that you can get stale in a year mm, 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 mm. so get back in the game now or just forget it this is definitely the last question, man. I feel like <laughs> this masterclass has definitely been what it is. Yeah. <laughs> this class in session on business and, uh, I mean, on entrepreneurship and you've been, raising. You've, you've been asking me two questions for the last 10 questions. No, 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 this is the last one, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the last one. Um, uh, man, I have so many more, but I'm like, no, I, I put a hand mm. stop at 2 o'clock. Mm. So, I want to understand... One of the biggest problems that we have as entrepreneurs and, and business people in, in today's day and age is employee retention. Mm. Um, so at this stage when you are when you are doing business, how do you retain employees? How do you prevent high turnover? Because uh, you are the pioneer. Mm. I speak this as somebody who did this in business and I saw people look at my staff offer them 10 times more, they are already... Uh, offer them better packs. H- how do you retain employees? I want to understand one of the biggest problems that we have as entrepreneurs and, and business people in, in today's day and age is employee retention. Mm. Um, so at this stage when you are when you are doing business how do you retain employees how do you prevent high turnover because uh, you're the pioneer mm. i speak this as somebody who did this in business and i saw people look at my staff offer them 10 times more they already uh, offer them better packs H- how do you retain employees i i at this stage i work with friends At my older age, let me tell you. And I work with friends who know I love them. Mm. And I work with friends who I say, if something better comes up, take it. And they never leave. I don't know what other formula to give you. I work with friends. I genuinely love them. They know I care deeply about them because I found out it has nothing to do with a paycheck. I tried all those things. Man, I even built a whole Google environment for people. <laughs> <laughs> I put, I put, I put, uh, you know. Canteen. uh, I, canteens. I did stuff. I fed people. I gave them free juice, you know, whatever. <laughs> I did a place for them to come and uh, feed their kids. If the kids want to come and do a work day with their parents, I'd built the rooms. People still left. And people still got upset. Mm. People still... Um, so I changed formula. I said, what should I do? I sold vision to people who really care for me and who I care for. And they said, let's do this. And I've seen those people in the beginning when I couldn't give them a salary, they did six months with no pay. Mm. And now they're fine, but they, they knew I'm in this to stay. Because first of all, I also left the door open. Mm. I said, if something else comes up, run, because I want the best for you. When people know you want the best for them, people know you genuinely love and care for them and their families, you're an asset. Why do I want to go work anywhere else? Mm. I could go to that big company, they'll give me the check, but then I have to work 19 hours. They expect me to jump every time. They say jump. No. Sometimes, especially more mature people, they're looking for family. Mm. <laughs> so I built a family. 
that's that's what we are so but my question now then expands mm-hmm. to what when one of your family members can't do a certain task or don't have the certain skill and you've got to employ somebody outside your scope yeah it, we adopt another family member oh, they come into I a mean, culture I'll, i'll tell you they come into a culture actually you build a culture you build a community right which is exactly what i've also done with church i don't just want to have a member i want to have a family it's a community what what do you benefit from being in this community there has to be a benefit mm. and so that i'll tell you richard it's a it's an amazing culture to have i wish i had discovered this earlier it's an amazing culture to have when you genuinely do care for people that means you're very selective who comes into that culture mm. very mm. because you don't want anyone coming to spoil the family so i've become that but at the same time i've become tougher in understanding that hey um you can hop jobs anytime but it's also be, it's become a free world but it's tough out there it is tough out mm-hmm. there this environment i've created for you it's not going to be easily replicable mm-hmm. so i've created a very tough environment for you to live and i'm not talking about nice offices i actually realized it's not the hardware <laughs> it's the software it's the software and neither does that mean you baby being babied i mean baby your people all, i have no babies <laughs> I had adults. And let me explain. Sometimes even a 28 year old can be an adult mm. in terms of workplace. I hired adults in the sense that I needed to know you don't need to be given work hours. You don't need to be told what time to be in the office. You're so driven by what it is you do. So I was very selective about the culture. Very selective this time. And I've started doing it in all my organizations. Mm. So that culture wise yes we're motivated by what we earn but there are certain other fundamentals that matter more and so we've created a very neat type of organization driven by just the fundamentals of humanity and once you do that you will actually find retention becomes easier but supposing you become big like a microsoft and all mm. you can still retain a culture Chick-fil-A have a culture mm. in America till today. Google have a culture. Google have a culture, right? Well, they've had to change theirs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because people just became a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> But even an organization as big as a Google, IBM have a culture. So I think once a company starts to take on that culture, retention becomes and some of those people stay. Warren Buffett has a culture about his companies. People start to stay because the value system of richard works for me mm. not the paycheck of richard the value system you know what i want to work for a man like this <laughs> and especially for the young generation and the next generation those things are becoming more important than a paycheck mm. the paycheck matters don't get me wrong to them but they're like no i don't want to work here and you don't feel it that word feel, feel it <laughs> is not working and you can't ignore them. Mm. They're the biggest spenders. They're the ones with the highest uh, you you have these stats much yeah. better than They're the biggest be. workforce. They're current, the biggest yeah. workforce. Mm. You cannot ignore them. But why are they saying no to very large corporates and yes to very small companies? They have a language that you need to crack and that language is bigger than how much money am I paying you? That that's no longer a uh, a sexy thing mm. <laughs> as mm. far as as far as work is concerned mm. yeah it's bigger than that it's bigger than that did you come from my dad's funeral mm. did you did you show up for my baby's first birthday mm. what are your thoughts about my future how do you feel about certain fundamentals are you present or are you just uh the very high retention will be found with people who speak that language very high turnover will be found with tyrants mm. i realize care has become such a huge fundamental mm-hmm. business mm-hmm. principle 
it is. Mm. Or the, the DNA of the business, yes. care has to be there. You see, the Bible told us that a long time ago. We just thought we were too smart. I love when you go here. Yes. For Fanua, break it down yes. for us. He did. He said the, the greatest of these is love. Mm. If you want to retain people, love them. <laughs> it's, it's the greatest. All these other things don't... This is the greatest of all these. And and it's it's evident throughout history that where you've had kings... What brought about the French Revolution is when the queen was told that people have no bread to eat. Mm. And she said, why don't they eat cake? Ooh. <laughs> why? why aren't they eating cake? That's where the, the, that's where the word queen cake came from. <laughs> For real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Joking. The French Revolution, they were upset. <laughs> Wait a minute. What kind of disconnected ah, it's queen crazy. Yeah. do we have? Mm. They, that, she, did she just tell us <laughs> she can't get bread? And they revolted. And they finished that dynasty completely. Oh. The point is, when you care, whether you're a king or a janitor, case in point, let me give you a, a very quick case. I have a hmm. friend who came to see me a few weeks ago, told me an amazing story about a university, a university we've partnered with as a church. And, um, and in this university, uh, one amazing leader called Dr. Dr. Sam Chand mm. was the former president. It's a 100 year plus university. Mm. And you know, one time he's coming to the university, he goes and he's like, um, finds the janitor and the janitor is there doing his job. And Dr. Sam Chand says, hey, how's your day going? Can I get you some water? The janitor's like, you're the school president. Why in the world do you care? You know? And Dr. Sam Chand goes and gets him water and brings it and they engage in a conversation and all of a sudden Dr. Sam Chan walks away saying to himself I just found my successor <laughs> and right now the guy who's the president of that university is called Dr. Benson Karanja and he took over from Dr. Sam Chan he was the janitor he was the janitor what when people know you care and genuinely care they'll stick with you they'll stick with you. Do you want to retain people? Just care. Check or no check, care. It's a fundamental of life. Oh, <laughs> man. First of all, I want to tell you a big thank you for coming to Class in Session, for being our Just first guest on Class in Session. I mean, yeah. you have schooled us thoroughly. <laughs> uh, I'm glad because you're going to be back <laughs> yeah, I'll be back. With, with, with time. Yeah. Um, and the next time he comes back, I want you guys to be the ones that are asking the questions. So he's shared so much. If you've got any questions throughout all these different videos, please, 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 please write them. Uh, Derek and myself and Nick, who's here, we will curate them and we'll be sure to feed them to him. A big thank you to you, Julian Kula. Thank you. Thank you so much for the insight that you shared. I, I, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I hope it was helpful. It was. It definitely was. Yeah. Okay. All right, Richard. Thank you.